This is day 21 of our 21 days of devotion, of prayer and fasting, and I got to tell you that it's been quite an experience in my life personally, as I know, as well as many others. I've done kind of a partial fast where I've just kind of done a very strict vegetarian diet <clears throat> for four days. I went with just water alone. That was tough. But I know there are several people that have, have joined along with us 21 days of journey. And uh, we have seen dramatic answers to prayer in the congregation among us and God's hand at work. And it has been something that uh, has been new to my life and I know new to other people's lives as well. And I firmly believe when we fast and pray together that God in Isaiah, he says in Isaiah 58, that he hears our voice in unique ways and answers prayers. And I can't wait to eat some eggs cooked in butter tomorrow morning. <laughs> And uh, maybe even some gravy tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> but you know, it's been great using Facebook during this time. We've had devotions up on our Facebook. Follow us on Facebook. We've had some interaction where we could talk about our praying and fasting experience and support each other uh, with doing that. And it's been a great way to communicate. And we're no longer going to have those devotions up daily. But on our website, we've got our top 10 list of our prayer concerns that we want to be praying about for 2012. And they're going to be posted on our website continually. Uh, but it's been a great way to talk about announcements. Last week before Sunday, we announced that Lucas Hogue is going to be here and got that out on Facebook. And, and uh, today we're talking about that. Next week, we're going to have Lucas Hogue, February 12th. He's going to be singing. He's a Christian country music artist. And what we're going to do, this is important, especially if you've got kids is we're going to do the preaching in the first half and take the kids in the back and uh, then they're going to, some of them are going to come back out when he starts singing but Lucas Ho is going to be singing in the second half so uh, we're going to go right out of the chute with, uh, with preaching and communion and worship and then have the singing on that so, but Facebook has been a great way to be able to talk about things like that and today begins our second sermon in this series, Not a Fan and it has, I love it when we are preaching on the same topic that our small groups, our connect groups, are talking about during the week. We're kind of on the same page with that. There's a, just a really neat dynamic with that. And during this series, we're challenging ourselves to ask the question, am I a fan of Christ or am I a genuine follower of Jesus Christ? We had over 100 adults in, in the connect groups this past week. And uh, if you have not registered for that, you have an opportunity. Go ahead and join today when you walk out and get into a group this week and, and experience what that's about and grow deeper in your faith. One of the, uh, we had somebody in our group say this. He said, you know, I love this church. Ever since the 90-day tithing challenge, then this 21 days of devotion, and now not a fan, there's so much happening, and it's changed our family. And that's the impact that a follower has when they pick up from going from a fan to a follower. The title of today's sermon is The Open Invitation. There's kind of a theme verse that we're using for not a fan, and it comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 23, when Jesus says this, anyone who would come after me, he must take up his cross, deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. <clears throat> Last week during the sermon we talked about the DTR talk where we define the relationship where we ask ourselves the question is my relationship with Jesus Christ one out of commitment or one out of convenience? And we ask the question today really what we want to focus on is that Christ offers the invitation to anyone. That Christ offers the invitation to anyone. So before we get into the sermon I want to uh, ask that you'd pray with me. Father, we, we thank you for your loving kindness in our lives and being able, especially over the past three weeks, to be able to see your hand at work so mightily and the answering of prayers dramatically and seeing your, your hand involved in our lives. I pray today that you would meet us where we are, that not everyone is in the position that some are. And I pray, Father, that we could be about moving from fan status to becoming a follower. I pray that you would have each of us hear what you would have us to hear today, that we could follow you more closely in our walk. As we lift up the name of Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. You know what? I just, just give a hand clap if you love Jesus this morning. You know, he is actively changing people's lives, and we never, never, ever want to forget that. 
I heard about a preacher that uh, went from being a minister and decided to be a, a funeral director. And he, there he is in his funeral director place, and a buddy walks in. And he says, "What in the world are you doing here? What do, what do you you go from being a minister to a funeral? How'd that happen?" He said, "Well, let me tell you something." He said, "Being in the ministry was the most frustrating job I've ever had in my life." And he said, "Take for example Hank over there. Hank had these alcohol problems; couldn't lay off the bottle." He said, "I worked with old Hank, and he got off that bottle. After a couple of years, he went back to drink." He said, look, there's Susie over there, take for example. Had difficulty in her relationships and, oh, I, I worked with her and counseled with her. And she came out of that, but it wasn't long she started living the way that she was living again and just went back to those destructive relationships. He said, I tell you what, I became a funeral director because here, when we straighten them out, they stay straight. <laughs> And you know, Christ would, that He would straighten our lives out and we would stay straight, but He's got a lot of straightening out to do in some of our lives, doesn't He? And that's one of the things that we're about, is to think about how Christ can straighten our lives. In, in our Not A Fan Connect group this past week, uh, we asked the question, you know, what do you expect out of this group? And one of the, the people there in our group said this, you know, after all these years, I think I, I've been a fan and I want to learn what I can do to become a follower. I think I need to do more. She needs a little more straightening out, I think. And I think many of us feel that way sometimes, don't we? That, Lord, can't we just be straight and be close to you all the time? And I think we think that way for a couple of reasons. I think one is, one's just the natural ebb and flow of the Christian walk. That the Bible says be filled with the Spirit. And sometimes we're, we're filled with the Spirit, sometimes we're not. But you know that takes a, a regular diligence and prayer and study and devotion to stay filled with the Holy Spirit. And we have that ebb and flow of our faith. I think one of the reasons that we feel that way too, that we need straightening out, is because of the effects of sin. The Bible says we've all sinned. Romans 3.23 said all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that falling short of the glory of God is the picture in the Greek of somebody pulling back a bow, the archer, and releasing that arrow, and that arrow not hitting the target. It's missed its mark. And a lot of people in their walk miss the mark often. And we need a little more straightening out. But the Bible says all wrongdoing is sin. And sin separates us from God. But the good news of the gospel is that God restores that relationship and brings us closer back to Him, when we trust fully in Jesus Christ. And with that in mind, I want to look at a person in Scripture who needed a little straightening out. And our text today is going to come from Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 36, if you'd like to turn there. And I want to see how Christ has an open invitation for anyone, and how Christ in this Scripture had an open invitation for a sinful person. So in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, the Bible reads this. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now in Jesus' day, when somebody invited a famous teacher over, they would invite them into their house and they would leave the door open. So passers-by could hear the conversation. And if a lot of people entered the house and listened to that conversation, it was a tribute to the person, the host, that he had somebody famous in his house. And that's what this Pharisee had done. Verse 37 goes on. Then when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And she came to join in on that conversation. And I think there's three words that aptly uh, describe this woman. And one is sinful. We don't know a great deal about this person in Scripture, but the Bible says that she was a sinful person, she had a sinful past. Most students of the Bible think that she was probably a prostitute or she had some other character flaw. But everybody in the community kind of knew about it, that she had this bad reputation. And verse 38 goes on. As she stood behind him, Jesus, at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. I think another word to describe this woman was searching. She was searching for something different in her life. She heard that Jesus was in the area, so what'd she do? She picked up a jar of perfume, a tool of her trade, and she went to find Jesus, and she followed him to where he was. And, 
And she kind of surrendered in this moment in full allegiance to Jesus. And you know, I've observed that many people who are searching in their life, especially if they're involved in some uh, illicit behaviors or addictions, they genuinely are searching for a way out. They are seeking for relief, seeking for freedom in some sense. They, they need some straightening out and they know it. And you know, they promise themselves, I know I'm going to do better. I want to do better. I want to get out of this lifestyle. I was called recently to a home where a person uh, was trembling and uh, they were kind of going through withdrawals and prayed over them and they wanted to do better and the person said to me, you know, I just can't seem to stay straight for longer than two years at a time and they want to do better. And I think this woman in Scripture knew that Jesus called people to a different life and deep down in her soul she wanted to follow that path. I think a third word that aptly describes her is sorrowful. She appeared to be a, a repentant woman. I like that proverb that says, no matter how far you've gone down the wrong path, turn back. And this lady had gone down the wrong path for a long time, but she wanted to turn back. And I take it that she'd heard Jesus teaching before. And when she heard she was, he was nearby and that he accepted anyone, she said, I'm after that. Maybe this is the answer. And that day, as she yielded to Christ, you know, that contrast between God, Christ's purity and her sinfulness just caused her to weep. She just weeped profusely, so much so that the feet of Jesus became wet and she let down her hair and wiped his feet. I mean, those are some, some intense tears to weep that much. But now, I want you to see the response of the host that observed this woman and Jesus, the host that had invited everybody in. It's quite a contrast. Verse 39 tells us that when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. In other words, you know, a real prophet, he know that this person's not acceptable. Now to be a Pharisee in that day, these people vowed to be dedicated to follow the, 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 the scriptures to the letter of the law, the Old Testament. They were good moral people on the outside, but on the inside they had some problems, some judgmental issues, I believe. In the book of Matthew chapter 23, six times Jesus refers to the Pharisees as, as hypocrites. They had no compassion for real sinners. Did they? It's been said this, that God prefers a loving sinner over a loveless saint. This Pharisee was a loveless saint who had this condescending attitude toward this woman off the street. And Jesus now, look at how he responds to this Pharisee and to this woman. Verse 48. And Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. You see, the Pharisees saw a prostitute. But Jesus Christ saw somebody who needed healing and needed some straightening out. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. The invitation is to anyone, and anyone is welcome. You know, over the years, I think that people have heard that message, oh, anybody's welcome in the church, everybody's welcome, but what's the catch? I mean, there's always a catch, right? And people are thinking, what's that small print of the gospel? I mean, where are they going to get me on it? There's no small print in the gospel. There's no hidden fees. And when Jesus said, anyone... The crowds would have just given one look at Jesus and his disciples and they would have thought, you know what, he meant anyone. I mean, look at this group of rabbinical students. To his culture, Jesus was anything but conventional and Jesus' followers were anything but acceptable. So I want to tell you a little bit about rabbis and their followers. A rabbi in Jesus' day was a teacher of God's Word. They knew especially the Torah, the first five books of the law, the first five books of the New, Testament, the New Testament, and then the other prophetical books as well. And what a rabbi sought after in his day was to get 
a whole group of good students. They were called Talmudim or Talmud in the singular. So there was kind of this testing process to go. So every group, every rabbi had this group of Talmudim, these followers that would follow them and learn so they could become one day a rabbi also. It was an exclusive relationship. Few were chosen. And those who didn't make the cut would probably go back to their family's business and they would be tradesmen or fishermen or something. But if you wanted to be a follower, and most youth did, you had to go through an, a, a, a process of acceptance. You had to have these, you had to have, just kind of like our, our GPA scores and our transcripts, you got to have some good scores to get into kind of an elite school back then like you do now. If you want to go to Harvard, you got to have, you know, a 4.0 on your GPA and at least a, a 32 on your ACT or 1600 on your on your SAT to even get looked at let alone accepted at an elite school such as Harvard the same was true with the rabbi school as well if you were somebody applying and you wanted to be a Talmud you needed to have a high level of astuteness I mean rabbis were selective because the student reflected the rabbi. If you had a poor group of students, well, you're not, you weren't going to be a sought-after rabbi in that day. And on the other hand, if you had an exclusive group, this high-class, high-knowledge group of followers, you were going to be esteemed. And that's what everybody wanted. But Jesus changed all the prerequisites. He kind of flipped everything, switched the system, and he accepted the unacceptable. So when people looked at Jesus' disciples, they looked at Jesus, they were perplexed and they shook their head and they thought, this is this guy's Talmudim? I mean, look at that. Look at those two guys. They used to be fishermen. And look at those two political hotheads. I mean, that one used to be a tax collector. But Jesus made the invitation to anyone. And many people in that day who had given up their dream now had an opportunity to follow a rabbi this rabbi named Jesus. And they realized when he made the invitation, he was serious that he meant it. It was to anyone. And anyone means everything. You know, I, I think that probably we never cover some of this sometimes, but I think there's this unwritten rule that we never say out loud. You know, we don't really buy into the idea that the church is for everyone, do we? I mean, think about it. When, when we first join a church and we walk through that door, and we like it, we like it to stay just the way that it is. And we prefer things through the years to remain the same. It's just when we walk through that door for the first time, but same, the same soon becomes the standard, and the standard becomes a qualification, doesn't it? I remember in my first ministry, we didn't have the screen, we couldn't play videos, we uh, did things a lot differently and we went we went to a video and we did away with the hymnals and we sang from the screen not everybody liked it because the same had become the qualification and I think Jesus knew human nature pretty well and I think that's why that we're studying this verse of scripture right now when Jesus said if anyone would come after me because Jesus does away with the qualifications he got rid of that long list of prerequisites of what's it required to join. And the church, I think, should be mindful of thinking about those preconceived qualifications. And don't get me wrong, I know we're not really out loud on that, but we have some unwritten codes. I mean, in our minds, we've got these unwritten codes. I mean, we, we probably have some of us unwritten dress codes about how a person should dress when they come to church or you know there might be some unwritten a little bit political code as well and a lot of churches we've made these long list of codes from drinking and smoking and and, and listening to this style of music or having any music at all the list gets pretty long sure the church keeps saying well anybody's welcome but you know those people looking on the outside looking in they're looking hey I think they got some prerequisites there some qualifications I uh, remembered this story last week talking with a friend of mine and uh, me and a buddy when we were in seminary we decided to go to a popular black church. It was a large black church well known in Cincinnati and it was the day before Martin Luther King Jr's birthday celebration and uh, we, walked, we got there late, didn't know where we were. We walked through the rear door right when the preacher said, and they killed Martin Luther King Jr. and he was looking right at us and people had turned and I mean 
we felt only two white guys in this entire audience. And we nervously made ourselves over to the seat. But I was so relieved, the preacher instantly said, but we forgive just as in Christ God forgave us. You know, we made it there. And, and it was a great experience, and, and we were even invited to lunch. But there are some preconceived qualifications sometimes when people are walking into a church for the first time. And Jesus got rid of those when he said anyone. But anyone also means no excuses. No excuses. The tradesman who wasn't able to make the grade now had no excuse because now he was called to follow Jesus Christ. The dropout couldn't complain about his past anymore. The mother of four couldn't say, you know what, I never had an opportunity to train with the rabbi. So here's the question. What has been your excuse? What has been your excuse? I really believe that a lot of people have put off following Jesus because they've been busy in life. And they're busy with their job. They're busy without a job. They're busy with their kids. They're busy with their marriage. They're busy because times are tough. What has your excuse been? It's easy to hide behind all kinds of excuses because who's going to argue with somebody who's going through a traumatic experience or a tragedy or scarred? But Jesus offers the invitation to anyone and that means no excuses. Anyone is welcome to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Anyone with a sexual past? Anyone. An ex-con? Anyone. An inmate? Anyone. It's recently divorced? Anyone. Legalist? Anyone. Alcoholic? Anyone. Pothead? Anyone. Hypocrite? Anyone. Rebellious teen? Anyone. And you know, when we start accepting people into the church, anyone into the church, it's going to force us to deal with those unwritten codes. It's going to force us to come to grips with those comfort zones in our lives and to rub shoulders with people we wouldn't probably particularly like because of these unwritten codes. People who have different music collections. People who dress in ways that really annoy us. But followers are willing to break down the walls and get rid of the unwritten codes and to allow anyone into God's family. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, wait just a minute. We can't invite just anyone in there and invite anybody in and accept and tolerate anything that they want. That's not biblical. You're right, that's not biblical. And we're not saying that we're going to tolerate or condone any sin. But when Jesus made the invitation and when a person responds today to the invitation, we accept those people right then with the past that we don't approve of or the noted life that makes us a little bit embarrassed, fans don't know how to handle those people, but followers accept them with open, open and loving arms. So anyone means no excuses. And anyone means everything. When a, when a Talmud was finally accepted by the rabbi, he would leave his home and completely follow the rabbi wherever he went. And here's why. The Talmud, the disciple, is more than just a student. A student gets along with the teacher and does the work to make the grade. The Talmud does the work because he wants to become what the rabbi is. A Talmud wants to be the teacher. So, the Talmud would follow and be totally devoted to the teacher. And it was a very intense and personal relationship. And the student learned everything about the rabbi there was to learn. He listened to him. He listened to his dialect. He watched his movement. He would mimic him. It was so close that when they were walking along, that the rabbi would bend down and pick up a piece of straw and put it in his mouth. The Talmud would follow and do that as well. In fact, there's this old phrase in Jewish history that says, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi because the Talmud, the followers of the rabbi would follow so closely when they went from town to town it was dusty back then they would literally be covered with the dust of the rabbi and when you followed closely it meant something may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi that's the closeness of the relationship that Jesus wants with us his followers still today and that's what he offers one of the common questions that I've received already from this Not A Fan series is, how do I make that transition? How do I move from fan status to follower? 
Well, it's right here in Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The invitation is yours to accept or to reject. And you know it's great when you come to Christ and to have your sins forgiven. You get baptized and you're raised up out of that water and you're so relieved, you're straightened out once and for all. I was 20 years old when I did that and I took that step. And I, I was elated to know that Greg's past was totally wiped clean. I loved it. But you know what happened? It wasn't before long. But I sinned again. And I thought, man, I blew it. What am I going to do? You know what sin that's, it was that so entrapped me? You know what it was? Good. Because a preacher shouldn't stand up here and tell every sin that he's ever committed, should he? But I had sinned. I had messed up. And you know what? But there's a thing that happens that we need to stay the course when we mess up. Luke 9 says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Bible, Bible commentary Leon Morris says that Jesus was speaking about personal death daily. He said that taking up one's cross daily was about self-sacrifice. And in the original Greek, this verse is written in the continuous the present continuous tense and it provides three action steps for us to follow. It says keep on denying yourself, keep on taking up your cross, and keep on following me. Sometimes we mess up but we keep following and we stay the course. How does a person make that transition from fan to follower? Let's look back at this sinful woman and see how she did it. First, you need to go to the place to where Jesus is. Go to the place to where Jesus is. This sinful woman probably felt very uncomfortable entering into the house of the Pharisee who knew her past. She probably thought the onlookers who were there to listen to Jesus also thought, you know, this woman isn't accepted in this crowd. But she moved beyond her self-conscious feelings to go to the place where she knew she could receive healing. And you got to know that when you've got this sin baggage and people know you in town and there are people in this church that know you, it's going to be difficult to bridge that gap from where you are to where you need to go. And I tell you, instinctively, we don't want to do that. Instinctively, people don't want to go to church. They don't want to have the preacher to stop by. They, they don't want to listen to Christian music on the radio. They don't want to read the Bible. They don't even want to pray really or even be around Christian people. But the church, it's been said, is a hospital for sinners, not a hotel for saints. And when you're sick, you take the medicine, even when you don't want to take it. And when you're not right with Christ, you do what it takes. You draw closer to Christ because you know that's where the healing is going to be. And it doesn't hurt so much. Jesus said, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And let me tell you something. Satan's burden is heavy, but Jesus' burden is light. So go to the place where Jesus is. Secondly, this woman, be overwhelmed by Christ's incredible love. This woman was overcome by the fact that Jesus cared for her even when she was a sinful woman. And you know, sometimes when we blow up big time, we wonder, God, do you really love me anymore? Have you just totally rejected me, God? Do you just want to punish me in my life, God? But Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You want to know how much God loves you? Look at the cross, because Jesus died for you. He took hell upon Himself instead of you taking it because that's how much Christ loves. Be overwhelmed by Christ's incredible love. Thirdly, completely trust God's amazing grace. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> and you know, some of you guys have accumulated a lot of sins in your life. And you've asked God to forgive you before and you think, you know what, there's no way, God, that you're going to forgive me. I remember a woman telling me before, how can God forgive me? I don't feel forgiven. But stand on God's promise that He forgives. He wipes the slate clean. He casts our sin into the deepest sea and remembers it no more. 
<clears throat> completely trust God's amazing grace. Fourthly, live like you're forgiven. Jesus said, go in peace. He didn't want her to go back to her tormented past. But he didn't want her to... What am I trying to say? He didn't want her to go back to her tormented past. He wanted her to be free. And he knew that she was going to have that inclination to go back there. And he knew that she needed to stay straightened out. And I'm sure that this lady, after she went straight, had some times to where she didn't stay the course, where she didn't stay the path. You know, if she had been a prostitute, she took that alabaster jar of perfume to that occasion to meet Jesus. And when she was there, she poured it out on Jesus' feet as if saying, you know what, I'm leaving that profession behind. And that's what many of us need to do, to make that decision to live like we're forgiven and to not walk down that wrong path anymore. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The invitation is open for anyone to move from fan to follower status. One of the things that we wanted to do today that we thought was important, this scripture about taking up your cross daily, it's serious business because that's what we need to do to move from fan to follower status. So on your way out, uh, we have gotten these small colored crosses and we're going to give one to each of you. And on your way out, make sure you grab one of these. They're, we're going to be handing out tickets to Lucas Hogue also for next week. But take one of these, put it in your pocket, put it in your purse, and when you touch it, when you see it, when you feel it throughout this series, remember what it stands for. That you want to become a genuine follower and what that is required of you to do is to deny yourself the things that you might want to do during the day that you shouldn't do. That you take up your cross, which was a symbol of suffering and shame. And you live for Jesus yet another day. Will you pray with me? Father, you have taken the symbol of a cross which was noted to be something terrifying in the first century and before and beyond. And today as we wear cross jewelry, maybe we have crosses in our cars, displayed somewhere in our homes, you've meant it now as a symbol to go in peace. That you loved us so much that you died a horrendous sacrificial death in our place. That we don't have to do that. Oh, Father, that we could be moved so much in our soul to understand that we don't have much time on this earth and that we could follow you in the remaining days that we do have. As we think about the cross, as we take it up symbolically in our lives, as we touch the one that we're going to receive today, that we could remember that your invitation is to anyone. That includes me. That includes everyone. And I pray, oh God, that you would speak to us today. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.